So welcome everybody and uh, welcome to Luke. Um, I'm going to be talking today to Luke Dinarona, the winner of the BSA Philip Abrams Memorial Prize 2021. And Luke is going to talk to me about his book, which I have here. It's called Deporting Black Britain, Portraits of Deportations to Jamaica. And it was published by Manchester University Press. This was the unanimous pick by this year's judges of the prize, who variously described the book as powerful, outstanding and unputdownable. Luke trained in sociology at the University of Bristol and completed his DPhil, which the book is based on, at the University of Oxford in migration studies and anthropology there. And he went from there to the University of Manchester and he is now lecturer in the race, ethnicity and post-colonial studies at UCL in the Sarah Parker Riemann Centre. So, Luke, congratulations on <laughs> winning the prize. Um, it's, it's, it's lovely to, to be able to award the Philip Abrams Memorial Prize. Um, I wanted to just to start by getting you to explain briefly what the book's about. Yeah, well, thanks so much for awarding me the prize. I'm really happy about it. I'm really grateful that you've engaged with the book so closely um, in, in, in preparing for this as well. Um, so the book is, is about deportation. It's about deportation from the UK to Jamaica, in particular focus on, focusing on the life stories of four individual men um, for whom there's kind of an individual chapter for each. Um, the kind of politics or the policies that, that led me to focus on this group were that in the UK, of course, we know about the aggressive draconian immigration system, the kind of successive home secretaries that have made their careers on uh, punishing and saying they'll deport more migra more migrants and stop people at the border and Priti Patel is kind of the extreme end of that and we're currently uh, facing. But in about 2006 the UK, after a decade or so of kind of bashing asylum seekers and moral panic about asylum seekers, discovered a new folk devil in the foreign foreign offender or foreign criminal or foreign national prisoner and what happened then was that uh, a lot of people who've been in the UK since they were very young and caught up in the criminal justice system found themselves in being detained and being threatened with deportation from everything they knew. Um, and I'd come across stories of that in reports and kind of wanted to, for, and, I'd, and I'd done some research on the media representations of, of so-called foreign criminals. And I wanted to meet people after they'd been deported in this, in these, who fit that kind of category. And so that's, that was the motivation for the book. And that's really what the book's about. It's, it's about um, tracing those life stories of people who grew up in the UK. Um, the four guys in the book spent roughly half their lives here, arrived between the ages of 10 and 14, um, and were deported in their 20s. Um, from children in some cases, from parents, from best friends and family members and partners and stepchildren. Uh, so the book kind of goes to Jamaica, um, I met people there, asked them kind of about their lives, got to know them really well. And then this is kind of a set of life stories yeah. that firstly describes the those life stories and, and for me hanging out with, with people, but, but then moves to kind of theorise and to try and build some concepts about Britain and about borders. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a really harrowing read, it's, you know, the, 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 the detail that you provide. I wonder if you can tell me a bit about the methods that you use, the kind of deep ethnographic approach that yeah. you adopted. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it was this was for my PhD, so I kind of flew to Jamaica for the first time, and I should say that my interest was in, my initial interest was in the politics of immigration and racism here, um, crime and borders and their intersection, and I didn't know much about the Caribbean, so I went to the Caribbean, to Jamaica, um, in 2015, and then worked with a kind of um, local NGO there that had links with deported people, and just called people or met people, um, introduce myself and try to get to know them. So the methods were ethnographic in the sense that um, I was introducing myself and not for a one-off or, or two or, or set of two or three interviews, but kind of saying um, with that kind of ethnographic intention to hang out, to have informal conversations, to be a, a participant observer, which might mean following people around when they're just doing stuff in Jamaica. And I found that the people who were willing, which was a good number, were kind of 
isolated in the context of Jamaica, felt that their story was something that should be told because an injustice had been done to them. And, you know, some people decided to engage with me and we became um, close and, uh, yeah, spent a lot of time together. So there's, there's that method, which is the primary one, I suppose, hanging out with people in Jamaica, life story interviews, interviewing people for hours um, and hanging out. And then because I was interested in, you know, deportation not only as it impacts individuals but as it impacts friends and family as well I came back to the UK and um, met with people's friends and family who remained partners parents uh, mates and kind of went to the places where people lived and I suppose that for me was trying to patch together um, a set of life stories uh, and I kind of thought about that as you know it's the absences and the disjunctures are part of what these they're central to these stories so yeah. I, and I think that really impressed the judges as well I think we all felt that that moving backwards and forwards between Jamaica and the UK and sort of enriching the the, the life stories of, of these men was was really powerful mm -hmm. um it's I mean there's lots of challenging things about the content mm -hmm. of the book but what was challenging about the doing that field work for you yeah a few things I mean I think the hardest thing I remember was going back to Jamaica the second and third time and being really excited to see people who I'd come to know. Um, and then things often haven't got worse for, for some people. Um, people having lost weight that I didn't really know they had to lose. People um, being, you know, Jason was homeless and in a worse state at different points. So I think one of the hardest things was, I mean, anthropologists kind of talk about, about the the disconnect between the field as, as you know as it's called and the and the kind of desk or the academic context where you write and present papers or whatever it is and while I did keep in contact with people on whatsapp and all of that I think going back to Jamaica and just being hit by the kind of this isn't necessarily getting better I mean it did it did for some over five or six years but you know the second and third times I was going and just kind of you know trying to process all of that that you know while it's it it is exciting to write and to research, but um, it's about a very bleak, brutal and cruel subject. And I'm kind of there in Jamaica. And that was the world. Those were the eyes through which I saw and came to know Jamaica was people who felt quite scared there often and out of place and didn't want to be there. So that was yeah. that. basically it's a devastating topic. And that was the hardest thing about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just I mean, all credit to you for persevering with it because like I mean what it does for me as a reader is it opens up a world that as a you know as a white English woman I just feel I have no access to no no sense of at all I've I'd, like you I've, I've never never visited the Caribbean and just feel I've got no sense of it mm. um, and you open it up in such a, a rich way in the book um, it's it's very very powerful and straddling those emotions of, of, of doing field work. I think, um, I think you've done it brilliantly in the book. So um, um, yeah, go and read it people. Um, so uh, one of the things that you do in the, in the development of the argument of the book is you develop sociological concepts that give us a bit of a handle on the, the, these um, ethnographic data. Um, one that interests me was this um, notion of hierarchies of citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose the first thing I was trying to say from my research as a kind of finding was to argue that Britain is increasingly sort of multi-status. And I use the word multi-status because in sociological literature and other social sciences, people have described Britain as multicultural, um, talked about multiculture, which is which is slightly different, um, talked and also multiracial and talked about Britain as multi-racist. Um, so I thought it was, I wanted to find some way to put legal status into the mix, which other people have done too. Um, but to say that for sociology and for sociology of race and ethnicity in particular, legal status matters, citizenship and immigration status matters as a kind of division or inequality. Um, but the question then is how to kind of analyze it beyond just describing something which, you know, I, literature on super diversity does that, for example, but I wanted to, to do something different. And I think hierarchies of citizenship deliberately points to hierarchy and power. Um, so actually the hierarchies of citizenship in the book has the hierarchies of non in brackets citizenship. And so it's worth saying there are hierarchies of non-citizenship, that is hierarchies among people who are, who are migrants in, in the law. 
Um, and there's a question then about how legal status produces different hierarchies and, and stratifies in terms of people's access to rights, to public uh, funds, uh, where they can, what they can do for work, whether they can leave a spouse. Um, and that these things all interact with other social divisions, racism, gender, class, region, age. So people with the same statuses in law can have very different experiences because, they're, because of their class position, because of their gender, because of their race. Um, you know, so an Australian backpacker might be uh, breaking the law by working in a bar, but they might be less, they, they will probably be less likely to be heavily policed than uh, young working class black people in general, yeah. um, particularly those who don't have. And there are lots of examples in the book about how racism is enacted by this intersection mm. of, of the, the justice system and the border controls. Um, and I just wondered if, if there were, a, you know, there were quite a few things that shocked me um, that I didn't know, you know, I felt, I feel quite guilty that I didn't, didn't know these things were going on. Um, were there things that, that shocked you when you discovered how those things, how that racism worked? Yeah, I'd say in one of the chapters, Ricardo, one of the people who I knew well, he started describing to me police, his experiences of police racism, and I kind of read all of the, I knew all of the disproportionality, and I knew that many young black working class people in particular areas are over-policed and, you know, disproportionately treated at every stage in the criminal justice system. But to hear someone describe being 14, 15, and then the police stopping you all the time, uh, following you back from school, kind of like not being able to go trick or treating because the police assume that you're going to rob someone. I mean, this like really extreme things for a child and people yeah. who've written about, about anti-black racism know that the, the kind of denial of innocence, the denial of childhood, of the right to childhood and the everyday, everywhere surveillance of people as they move through space um, is kind of what defines that form of racialization. But to hear someone describe that is just, and I thought about my life at 15 and what I was doing on the park yeah. and it was kind of the same, but there were no police there basically. Yeah. Um, so, so that was heavy and that was, that was still shocking. And it, and it, I, what I tried to write about in that bit is to say, you know, disproportionality and black people are X times more likely to be stopped and searched and white people won't do all of the work we need it to, um, that you do kind of need to think about what it is to experience that yeah. as a young person and that, and that it's worth, yeah listening isn't there's never not worth kind of listening to people's actual experiences yeah and that's and that's another powerful bit in the book i think is 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 providing these accounts um so that so that we can hear those stories i think that's mm. that's a really um important feature of the book mm. um one of the things that we also liked as, as judges of the book was um the way that you move from those micro level stories of these men's lives and their experiences and you zoom out to some of those bigger narratives around global politics and I wondered if you could expand a little bit more on, on that for us. Yeah I mean this is partly because I went to Jamaica and as I spent more time there I came to realise the literature on deportation which says these individuals are especially stigmatised or they're especially uh, unlikely to get work because they don't know the rules of the game and they don't speak the language that's all true but the other point is that a lot of deported people live among the kind of um, urban poor in Jamaica. And, and so in some ways you can see them as distinct because they've lived in the UK, but in some ways you can see them reintegrating into a particular place. Um, and so then you think about what is citizenship for all Jamaicans and, and what are the ways in which people are unable to move and how does kind of citizenship, which supposedly gives everyone everywhere uh, political inclusion, everyone should have a state that they belong to. Um, and everyone should kind of stay where they where they are from uh, under that system. I think when you focus on people's frustrated mobilities, the ways they can't move, the separation of families, people who are deported, people who are drowning in the seas, then you realise you know that citizenship is kind of um, it's kind of creates a set of mythologies about equal membership that actually build on colonial histories and colonial hierarchies. Uh, so Jamaica being a, a really obvious way to think of that, the borders of the US and Mexico being an obvious way, the borders of Europe as against the Middle East and Africa being again so obvious as the continuation of or reconfiguration of colonial histories through excluding particular types of people. So there's that and then there was also you know realizing that deportation as a set of political arrangements i.e you can't just deport someone, it's not banishment, it's arranging with the state to which they're being returned for their return. And that requires a whole lot of diplomacy. And, and therefore I wrote a little bit about how 
deportation policies and arrangements fit within a wider foreign policy and particularly aid, um, which is a real problem for, um, yeah, for, sorry, for immigration control. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. And we're not going to edit out the mistakes, people. This is real <laughs> life. <laughs> all I'm doing all the time, so. I'm, I'm waiting for my second cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> anyway, so to turn to a couple of questions about you, because I think it's just a nice opportunity, and we've had a bit of a chat before this, but you mentioned um, I, in the uh, acknowledgements, because I read the whole book uh, twice, um, that a number of sociologists feature um, in your journey. There's some theorists and critical thinkers that you draw on, but also supervisors and colleagues that, that influenced you. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your intellectual and sociological depth, you know, the sociologists who influence you. Yeah, sure. I mean, my PhD supervisor, my main PhD supervisor, is, she has a PhD in sociology, um, broadly writes in social science and politics, is Professor Bridget Anderson, who's now at Bristol. Um, her kind of thinking and critical approach um, and license to be as radical as I want to be were a big influence and a great guide. Um, and her work, uh, her book, Us and Them, is like a big influence to me and still a guide that I return to. My, my other influences, I mean, I suppose within that kind of critical cultural studies, anti-racist tradition. So the people like Les Back, who was one of my examiners and continues to be a source of you know, insight and conversation. And Claire Alexander was another examiner. These are two, by the way, sociologists who did anthropology PhDs. So we share a kind of uh, trajectory in that way. Um, Gargi Bhattacharya is a, yeah, I call her my auntie, but Gargi is a great, <laughs> a great friend and, and someone I spoke to throughout some of this work. Um, Stephen Mohan Valovan, who's at Warwick. And now my colleagues, um, Paige Patchen and Paul Gilroy continue to help me think through a lot of these things and you know Paul's work influenced me from from way back in the day partly through Stuart Hall and that kind of critical cultural studies um, work particularly on race and ethnicity and on Britain you know what is Britain and, and law and order politics and those kinds of things were really central to the intervention I was trying to make by saying let's put in the border um, and think about it from that kind of critical perspective rather than migration studies as such which I tended to yeah. find unsatisfying um, and then there are more people my kind of you know comrades and colleagues at my, of my kind of generation. So the people I've wrote a book with recently, um, seven other authors, Empire's Endgame, they're all, they were all there through the PhD. Um, and the people at Surviving Society, I don't know if you listen to that podcast, but they, they had me on twice. Um, and they were, you know, I learned a lot from their podcast and, and also got a lot of support from them as a, when I was a PhD student in early career, and still am early career, but very early career, you know, to kind of say this work's important and people should know about it. So there are loads of other people who've helped me along the way and friends who aren't in the academy, of course, but that's some of the coordinates of where yeah. I... Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I love the idea that we have this sort of sociological family, you know, yeah. to, to yeah. you know, we have like the, the, the people and, you know, some, some of those people are sadly no longer with us, but their ideas mm -hmm. are still mm -hmm. influencing what we do. So, yeah. you know, it's, it was really lovely to, to read again Stuart Hall and think about the way that you were using his work and, yeah. and you know, engaging with uh, Paul Gilroy's stuff again. Just really, yeah. really powerful um, intellectual ideas, but being used in this very new context of these deportations to mm -hmm. Jamaica and, mm -hmm. and really helping illuminate what's, what's going on mm -hmm. um, and what we should know about. Um, I think it's a beautifully written book um, and it's it's difficult to say this really, but it's a joy to read despite the disturbing subject matter. Um, I think um, one of the other judges said that they had a very late night, early morning because they just kept reading it because they, it, you just want to know what, what's going to happen to these, these uh, young men. Mm -hmm. um, and so as writers, I think, um, I'm, I, well, as a writer, I'm, I'm interested in, in your writing craft and your, the decisions you made about the style and the structure. Obviously, it's based on your PhD, but um, the book has a particular shape to it. Um, for example, you've chosen to use footnotes rather than make it look um, kind of densely academic with lots of, of references um, yeah. throughout. So can you tell me a bit about how the book was written and some of those writing choices? Yeah. So I, I'd wanted to do kind of, so the book has the four portrait chapters, Jason, Ricardo, Chris, Danico, um, 
so that was a decision I made early on because I kind of read a bit about portraiture. Lairs back again has an interview with Mitch Dunier where they talk about about the need to bring people to life on the page so people remember them. And I felt that that was one thing I had to do is make the book one where you kind of, when I say Jason, you kind of go, oh, is he the guy who did it, did it, it? Whereas in a lot of ethnography, if it's still quite hard to do that, I think. Um, so so there's that. And, and I wanted the, the guys themselves to be able to read it, even if even if some of the arguments are a bit much that, that and that's been true that people have read it, um, read shorter pieces as I've gone. So that kind of it being, it not complicating when it doesn't have to, uh, or keeping the language something that's maybe pleasurable to read or you don't have to stop every second sentence. I think work for this particular book, that's not to say that other books shouldn't be more challenging theoretically or more dense in their writing style, but this one I felt like it was, it made sense to write it this way. Um, and in terms of end, you know, using, I think it's EndNotes, we, I use that's partly the uh, editor, Tom, uh, Tom Dark at Manchester, you know, saying this is a book that can be crossing over from the academy to a trade kind of model. And this is a book that um, is beautifully written. And this is a book that matters to a lot of people. So that meant it was under 20 pounds, which was really important to me. <laughs> um, so there's that kind of decision, which is also about how the book was, is mm. Is positioned um so i think i think he's you know good editor there absolutely yeah, yeah. right i think it, i think it does bridge those those audiences really well um but i wouldn't i wouldn't um put down the intellectual weight mm. of the arguments because i think there's some really powerful sociological arguments here that that we're going to be returning to and mm. thinking about in years to come because mm. it really does open up a world and then show us how sociology can help us make sense of that mm. um, and as I said, it's quite a horrifying book. It's quite depressing in places. It highlights horrible, horrible racism that we should confront. And I know when we talked before we recorded this session um, about various passages in the book that I kind of highlighted and, and returned to. Um, but at the end of the book, at the end of these stories of, of these men and their families and friends that have been blighted by racism and injustice you do hold out a bit of hope and a bit of a challenge to sociology and I just wondered if you wanted to say a bit more about that yeah I mean quickly I should have just realized I forgot that um part of how I managed to write it was from getting postdoctoral fellowship with a sociological review who I should also shout out because they were incredibly supportive um of the project and gave me the space because it takes time to to do the writing it's painful but also pleasurable at times um yeah i can talk, talk about hope i mean i can read a little short um segment which is trying to it probably conveys better than i can paraphrase um what i tried to say at the end so this is kind of after reflecting on you know what can we learn from these stories and is there any hope Politicians and social commentators might imply that British society is being assaulted from without, but the outsiders are very much within the gates and they have been for some time. The primary concern of anti-immigrant voices seems to be that Britain will become unrecognisable to itself. And yet our hope must be that they are right and that Britain's multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-status realities will afford the country's young people a different kind of common sense in the process of Britain's remaking. Um, yeah, and so what I was thinking there is about, and we can think about this in terms of <laughs> demographic issues and um, young people and cities, but you know that we can't, if we're going to fight for a different kind of world, then we need to harness the energies of young people and others who live in contexts where the firm boundaries between racialized groups or firm boundaries between citizen and migrant are broken down through very ordinary forms of interaction or relationship building. And so the book is kind of saying that even though these are the people who face the hardest end of Britain's racist state violence um, in their everyday lives and the ways they lived before, they prove that actually these divisions don't hold sociologically in people's lives, they, that people exceed them, transcend them, ignore them, um, and that we should be fighting for everyone to have more space to do precisely that. Mm, yeah, and I, I like that call to arms, the kind of um, activist sociology that um, I, you know, that that's part of the reason I'm a sociologist is that that, that speaks to me as well. And mm -hmm. um, as you were talking there I was just, and reading that, I was thinking, 
you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if this book became part of the A-level sociology curriculum and, and uh, you know, that we had a generation of sociologists that came through with these mm -hmm. deep understandings of the intersections between racism mm -hmm. and nationalism and politics and policy and everyday lives mm -hmm. and really understood how sociology can speak to that and mm -hmm. help both make sense of it, but also do something about it. Um, and, and, and address those injustices and, uh, and begin the work of anti-racism. So mm -hmm. here's hoping lots of people yeah. will buy and read the book and take those ideas on board. And thank you so much, Luke, uh, for chatting with me today. Thanks, 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 thanks. Um, thank you to my fellow judges, Susan Halford and Stevie Jackson. Um, and just to say again that Luke is winner of the BSA Philip Abrams Memor Memorial Prize 2021. And this is the book, go and buy it because it's, it's a must read for 2021 and beyond. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much.